In this video, we're going to be discussing the Dix Hall Pike Maneuver. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll understand how to perform it, but also understand when to use it. So first of all, the Dix Hall Pike Maneuver is a diagnostic test. It's not a treatment. It's a diagnostic test for posterior and anterior BPPV. So BPPV is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, and there are two special tests or maneuvers that are used to diagnose BPPV, and those are the dix hall pike maneuver, which is always done first, that's what we're talking about in this video, and then also the horizontal roll maneuver, which we'll be talking about in the next video. So going from specific to general, BPPV is a specific type of vertigo, and then vertigo is a type of dizziness. Dizziness is a very general umbrella term. There's a lot of types of dizziness, but the type of dizziness that would clue you in that somebody might have BPPV is when they report that the room is spinning. And so if somebody says the room is spinning or you ask that and they say yes, you should ask if there's a visual change, a visual change that the room is spinning. And if they report yes, there is, that's a clue that they might have BPPV, and so you should perform the Dix Hall Pike Maneuver as a diagnostic assessment. So right here you see the starting patient position for the Dix Hall Pike Maneuver. The patient there on the table is going to be in long sitting, and they need to be on a spot on the table in which, if you were to recline them all the way back to supine, it would place their head over the edge of the table. In other words, the head would be dangling over the edge. Now from this long sitting position, you're going to rotate their head toward the test side 45 degrees. In other words, if you were testing their left semicircular canal, so left posterior and left anterior canals, you're going to rotate their head 45 degrees to the left. In this video, I'm actually going to show the test on the right side. So to test the right posterior and anterior canals, I'm going to rotate her head to the right 45 degrees. So there you have it right there. Once the patient's in this position, you're ready to perform the test. However, one thing I want to point out here is very important is my hand position. Notice one of my hands is supporting the patient's head and the other is supporting the back of their neck just below the occiput. The reason this is important is because I'm about to recline them all the way down to supine and their head is going to dangle over the edge of the table. And if I'm not holding on and supporting their head and neck, that head's just going to flop and it's not going to make the patient feel very good. It might actually cause an injury. You want to make sure you're supporting the patient's head adequately. The other thing it's going to allow me to do is accurately position the neck. The patient's still going to be in 45 degrees of rotation, in this case to the right, but I'm also going to position the neck into 30 degrees of extension. So make sure you have a good grip on the neck that allows you to control it, but also to stabilize it as you bring the patient down. Now we're ready to do the maneuver. So with the patient's head rotated to 45 degrees, in this case to the right, and their head supported in your hands, you're going to lay the patient down into supine and allow their head to move into 30 degrees of extension off the edge of the table. So in this position right here, she's got 45 degrees of rotation to the test side and 30 degrees of cervical extension. And in this position, you're going to monitor the eyes for nystagmus. If you have the recording goggles, you will have those on already and you will be looking in the computer screen. That makes it very convenient. If you don't have the recording goggles, then you're going to have to have the patient keep their eyes open and look into their eyes very closely. Okay? Either way, you're monitoring for nystagmus. Now, if there's going to be nystagmus in this position, it's going to have an onset well before 30 seconds. So you need to wait at least 30 seconds to make sure that if nystagmus is going to present, that you see it. However, if you don't see nystagmus after 30 seconds, there's not going to be any nystagmus, so you can then get them out of the position, which I will show you in just a minute. Now, if there's going to be nystagmus, it probably will not present instantaneously. There's going to be a slight latency or a slight delay of anywhere between 2 and 10 seconds, usually closer to the short end, like 2 to 5. And so when you see that nystagmus begin, that is the onset of the nystagmus. And from the onset of the nystagmus, there's several things about it that you need to monitor. And we're going to come back to those in just a minute. 
But before we do that, I want to briefly show you how you get out of this test position. So you're watching the nystagmus and it finishes, or we say fatigues, and then you're just going to reverse the original maneuver. So right now she's in 45 degrees of rotation to the right and 30 degrees of cervical extension. So you're going to keep the rotation. She's going to keep rotation to the right 45 degrees. And so while I help her get from cervical extension 30 degrees back to neutral in the sagittal plane, I'm also helping her sit back up into long sitting. But notice she's keeping that cervical rotation 45 degrees throughout the duration of that movement. Now, that movement back up to the original position, you don't need for a definitive diagnosis. However, some people like to see that when they do the reverse direction, they also get symptom provocation, which in some people's minds further rules up that the person has that particular type of BPPV. Now back to the nystagmus. What do I need to analyze in this test position in order to get a specific diagnosis and a specific treatment? Well, first understand that the dix Hallpike maneuver is only positive when the nystagmus is vertical. Okay? If the nystagmus is horizontal, or there's no nystagmus at all, that constitutes a negative dix hall pike maneuver, in which case you're going to have to move to the horizontal roll maneuver, and we'll be discussing that in the next video. So a positive dix hall pike maneuver, by definition, is the reproduction of vertical nystagmus. Now, when we talk about the nystagmus, it has a fast beat and a slow beat, and I go into this in much more detail with actual videos of nystagmus in a separate video, so make sure to go check that out in the description if you need more help. But basically, we're looking at the fast beat of the nystagmus. And that fast beat can either beat up or down. So the first thing here is that if you have a posterior canal that's implicated, the fast beat of the nystagmus is going to beat up. This is by far more common than beating down. And when you have up beating nystagmus with the dix hall pike, that implicates the posterior canal. The P in up is for the P in posterior. Remember that. If you have downbeating nystagmus, that implicates the anterior canal. Now, in addition to the nystagmus beating either up or down, it's also going to have a torsional component. This is a rotational component, and the rotation's either going to be right or it's going to be the left, and they'll be doing the same thing in both eyes. In both cases, the torsion is always in the direction of the affected side. So if you have upbeating nystagmus and left torsion, that would be a left posterior canal. If you had downbeating with right torsion, that would be a right anterior canal. So we've got up and down, which gives you whether it's posterior or anterior canal. We've got the direction of the torsion, which gives you the affected side, left or right. And the only other thing we have to look at is the duration of the nystagmus. Now, the duration is either going to be less than a minute, so less than 60 seconds, or it's going to be greater or equal to 60 seconds. And sometimes we just say greater than 60 seconds. So if the nystagmus, from the time of its onset to the time of its fatigue or its cessation, if it's less than a minute, it is a canalothiasis. This means that the autoliths are not adhered to the cupula. They're actually free-floating within the canal itself. This is much easier to treat, and these are also a lot more common. If the nystagmus, from the time of onset to its fatiguing, lasts longer than a minute, so longer than 60 seconds, that means you have a cupulolithiasis. This is where the autoliths are adhered to the cupula. With cupulolithiasis, the symptoms tend to be more severe and the treatment is a little more involved. Again, cupulolithiasis are nowhere near as common as canalithiasis. So, to summarize everything so far, if you have a patient who complains of dizziness and subjective reports of a visual change with the room spinning, that leads you down the road towards BPPV. So, to rule it up or rule it down, you use the dix hall pike maneuver. If the dix hall pike maneuver is positive, that means that it reproduced vertical nystagmus. If the vertical nystagmus is upbeating, that implicates the posterior canal. If the vertical nystagmus is downbeating, that implicates the anterior canal. And again, we're also looking at the torsional component, which gives us the affected side. We also look at the duration here. 
If the duration is less than 60 seconds, it's a canalothiasis. If the duration is greater than 60 seconds, it's a cupulolithiasis. And all these treatments down here, we're going to look at in the next few videos after we look at the horizontal roll maneuvers. So make sure to join us for those. They'll be following this video in the playlist. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of when to use the Dix-Hall Pike Maneuver, how to do it, and also how to interpret the results.